everyone. Hey, thanks so much for joining me today on Experience the Life with me, your host, Pastor Charlie Riley. I'm so glad that you are joining me. Listen, I pray that last week you got a hold of our program, whether it was through Facebook, whether it was through uh, whatever means necessary, watching right here on WHMB TV 40. Listen, we just want you to have the Word of God because we believe the Word of God will absolutely transform your life. Now, we are in a series right now this entire month, we're talking about the who of the Bible. The who. Who is God? And last week we talked about, you know, he's omnipresent, omnipotent. He's all these different things. He's triune in his nature, all those things. But more importantly, what I wanted to get to was the aspect that he is a loving God. He is a merciful God. And that the act of even uh, Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden was an act of mercy and love. The fact that when Adam and Eve sinned, they ran from God, but God ran, ran after them. You know, that, that's an act of God's mercy and God's love. You know, so oftentimes we hear this idea that God is mean and angry and mad and upset. I'm here to tell you that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God's anger was absolutely appeased. Now, I'm not to tell you, I'm not trying to say that in the future, you know, people without Christ don't have eternal judgment to face. The Bible is very clear about that, and that's why you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the reality is our God is an awesome God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. So with me saying all those things, oftentimes what will happen is people will say, yeah, but what about in the Bible? What about this whenever God uh, wiped out a nation? Or what about whenever God killed this person? Or what about this? What about that? And what I'm trying to get you to see is that God is always the same even though in the Bible it looks like he may be different, but his nature is always the same, loving, merciful, and all those things. So in light of that, who is God? Who is God? Here's the truth. You ready? Do you believe that God is love? Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God is for you? I'm here to tell you he absolutely 100% of the time is. There's never a question, never a question in God's mind about whether he is for you, whether he loves you, whether he, whether he wants to do and bless things in your life and bless you in your life. God wants to do big things in your life. But with that being said, I want you to remind, be reminded of this verse. He who does not, uh, does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, in light of that, we talked about it last week. Then why is God in the Bible? It seems like sometimes he's harmful, he's mean, angry, bitter. The original Godfather, you know, like Italian mafia type stuff. You know, why is that? Well, here's the truth. It has to do with the time period in the Bible called the law. Because what you will find is that the Bible could be broken into three time periods. And I'm going to give those to you on the screen all at once so you can see them. Time period number one is called the time period, I call it a time of faith and grace, where God dealt with the patriarchs for a period of 2,500 years. And this is where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, all those people fall into that category. And here's what's interesting about that time period. God did not deal with man according to their sin. Abraham sinned. He lied about his wife. Abraham had many issues, okay? Jacob had many, issue, many issues. Isaac had many issues. All these people of the Old Testament before the law had issues, but yet you still see God blessing them. You still see God's favor on them. Why? Because they were not, and, and the word is imputed, they were not imputed sin. Here's what I'm trying to say. God did not hold their sin against them. Okay, when did God begin to hold man accountable for his sin? During the second time period. This is whenever the law came in Exodus chapter 20 all the way until Jesus, is until Jesus died. This is a period of 1,500 years. Now, I want you to understand, during this time period, even though man sinned, God did not deal with him based on his sin. He dealt with him based upon faith and grace. All right? During this time period... God dealt with man according to the law. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. That's the way it was. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You have all these different things. And actually, there are 10 commandments, and we know those. But yet, did you know that there are over 600 commandments? 600 portions of the law that they were indebted to keep? 
And, and the reality was, a lot of people think we're supposed to keep the law today. But the whole purpose of the law was not that you could keep it. It was to prove that mankind on his own cannot save himself. Why? So that we would then entrust this time period and give our heart and, uh, and give, put faith in Jesus and what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So this is the time period from which we live right now. And it is a time period, just like this time period, of faith and grace. Where God, listen to this, this is so important, so important. And I know people are going to get upset, especially religious people. But God is not counting our sin against us. As born-again, spirit-filled believers, we are not being treated as if we are sinners. Matter of fact, I don't even like the word sinners because that's what I was. I am now a born-again, spirit-filled believer, and because of that, I am blessed. I am saved. I am blessed beyond a blessing, I tell you. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing when you understand it. So get this. Time period where God did not impute their sin. He did not count their sin against them. God did count their sin against them. Watch this though. Now God is not counting their sin against them. It's so important that you understand that. Now, I know that you're probably like, mm, let me just go, just hang on with the preacher, all right? Let me, let, let's, let's break it out and listen to what the Bible says. Chapter seven of Romans. Here's what it says. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? See, because when the law came, then man had a knowledge of what sin was. So is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except for the law. And again, if you missed last week's program, go back and listen to it, because I kind of set the foundation for this. It says, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. See, it's the law that brings the knowledge of sin. Now, look over at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, and here's what it says. What purpose then does the law serve? Okay, so what's the purpose of the law? Why did we have to have the law? Why did God have to deal harshly with man, even though that wasn't God's original design or God's intent? God didn't want to be, but God had to be. Why? Why? It was added because of transgression. And last week I told you that what happened was during that first 2,500 year period of time of the Bible, what happened was men would sin and they thought because God was not punishing them that God was okay with it. Well, God was not okay with it. And so the law was brought so that they would know what sin was. And that's what this verse is saying. Till the seed, the word seed there is capitalized. It's a proper noun and it means Jesus. Jesus is the seed mentioned in this verse. It should come to whom the promises was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now watch this. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Look at this. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could get, have given life. Notice this. This is awesome. The Bible is clearly saying that the law does not give life. It puts you under bondage. It puts you under sin. And, and this is amazing to me because how many times do we hear you got to live by the Ten Commandments, you got to live by the, I'm not saying we don't fulfill the Ten Commandments, but we do it by living by the Spirit of God, not by the law being forced on us. But so many times you hear that, people got to live by the law. The Bible says it very clear, for if they had been, uh, been a law which would have been given, which would have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. You cannot be made righteous in the eyes of God by keeping the law. The purpose of the law is to prove that you are not righteous. That's the purpose of it. So don't even try and get the Old Testament. Don't even try and live that portion of time out like the Israelites did. I know of people who, um, who obey the dietary laws of the law. Okay, that's all well and good if you want to do it for health reasons. That's fine. But don't think that by eating a certain uh, regimen, of the Old Testament, you're somehow pleasing God. Why? The Bible says if you fail in one part of the law, you've broken it all. So if you eat crawfish, come on now, Louisiana baby, if you eat crawfish, which is a shellfish, which was forbidden by the law, it's just as if you broke the Sabbath. Or it's just as if, how about this one? You had a shirt made of two different materials. If you break one part of the law, you break it all. Why? To bring us to a point of accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. See, God was trying to break mankind of thinking he could save himself. He needed a Savior, and that was Jesus. Because the truth of it is, none of us measure up to the standards of God. I mean, think about it. That's what Jesus had a problem with 
with the Pharisees. They thought they could measure up to God's standard. Are you kidding me? No way. God is perfect. We can never measure up. So get this. It goes on to say this. But the scripture has confined all under sin. That's the purpose of the law. All under sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who what? Believe. That's right, baby. We don't do the works of the law. We believe. When we believe on him who justifies the ungodly, that's when we are saved. That's what makes us born again. And it's amazing to me. Now, I'm going to stir it up a little bit, so just be careful, all right? So here's the deal. It's amazing how we're justified. We're, we're, we're saved by faith and grace alone, okay? But then after we get saved, people want to put us under the law. People want to say, well, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this and you got to do that to stay saved. No, that's not true. Now, you will do that if you're truly born again. You'll do the works of the law, but not as a meeting of the standard to make yourself righteous in the eyes of God. You will do it because you love and obey God. And I promise you this, no one can measure up completely. But nevertheless, it goes on. Look at this next portion of, of the Bible. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under a guard by the law. Before faith, before faith in Christ, the law was given. And this is where God looks mean and harsh. Why? If a man sins, he dies. If he does bad, he gets bad. God was trying to prove your standard is not good enough. That's the only thing he was trying to do. Kept for the faith which, was after, which would afterward be revealed. Look at this. Therefore, the law was our tutor. The law was, law was our tutor. It was to bring us to a place of Christ, to bring us to a place of Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's right. Look at this last part. This is the best part. But after faith came, has come. Now that faith is here, faith in Jesus, guess what? We don't have to live it. We are no longer under the tutor. We're no longer under the law. We don't have to necessarily keep the Sabbath, although do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. So we definitely want to go to church and do all those things, but we don't have to meet all the law requirements. Because remember, if you live by one portion of the law, you have to live by all of it, and no one can measure up to the entire portion of the law. I think about the first man who died under the law, he was picking up sticks on the Sabbath. I mean, that's pretty bad. You go out to pick up your yard and you're stoned to death by the end of the day. But that's how cruel the Old Testament law was. Now remember, this series, we're talking about the who. What was God saying? Why did God allow that? Well, God allowed that. Now, it's not what we're living under now. But God allowed that time period in that portion because men misunderstood. They thought that they could sin against God and everything was okay. You know, it kind of reminds me of the culture that we live in today. People think they can sin and do whatever, say whatever, be whatever. And guess what? God has no problem with it. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Bible is very clear about the standards of God. The law was given so that we would understand that the law of God was given so that we could understand the standard of God. Now, we're not to live by the law, okay? But that's what the standard was. But the standard was never to prove you righteous. The standard was just to say, hey, this is where God's at on this. All right, look to the law to see what God is. Don't try and appease the law, though, because you'll never make it. No one can measure up. Actually, if you try and live by the law, you'll end up defeated and depressed and actually yoked to your sin, no doubt about it. See, so during the time period of the law, here's the truth. They served God through fear of God, not through love of God. And I'm here to tell you under the New Testament, as a new born-again Christian, I'm to serve God out of the love for God not out of fear of God. And I, and I know the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I understand that. I understand that those people were under the law too. I understand this. I am not fearful of the Lord. And I know, oh, blasphemy. No, I'm not fearful of God. Why? God sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross for me. If he came for no one else, he came for me. I'm his favorite. And so are you, praise God. So listen to this. You've got to understand that quit trying to appease God with the law. Believe in Jesus. Believe this. Watch this. Believe Jesus appeased every part of the law, and because Jesus appeased every part of the law, you are no longer a debtor to the law. Come on now. Jesus met the law. I don't need to meet it. Jesus met it. All the blessings of the law, I get because Jesus met. Mm. Think about that for a while. Out of bless you, no doubt. I think about even this. Check this out. There's a story in the Old Testament about Elijah calling down fire. Now watch this. The same story. Now this is, this is the same action. The people rejected him, he calls, calls down fire. 
Watch this. The disciples ask Jesus about this because they want to call down fire. I know some Christians that like to call down fire on something. Anybody ever steal your parking spot? I'm going to call down fire. <laughs> Here it is. You ready? Check this out. Shoot your deer out from under you. Well, it wasn't your deer, but you get what I'm saying. I don't know if there's a deer hunter out there, but if you are, praise God. Here it goes. It says, now it came to pass and when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go up to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his, uh, before his face. And as they went up, they entered into a village of the, of the Samaritans uh, to prepare for him. Now watch this, this is powerful. But they did not receive him, didn't receive Jesus, because his face has set, uh, was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them just as Elijah did? Look, Elijah did it because he was under the time period of the law. And he could do that. They do good, they get good. They do bad, they get bad. Punishment, there it is. But Jesus is changing that because of his death, burial, and resurrection. He said, whoa, time out, guys, time out. That's not what I want. Matter of fact, if Elijah was living today, he wouldn't call down fire. I know um, in American culture, a lot of times people are like, we're under the judgment of God. We're under the judgment of God. No, Jesus came and took our judgment, all right, so that we can receive the blessing. And I know what people are saying. Do I not believe in the judgment of God? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying during this time period, this dispensation of the church from Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection to this very day, God is not dealing with man according to their sin. He's not. He's dealing with them through faith in Christ, faith in grace. That's what he's dealing with. Now, there is a time at the end when the rapture of the church happens where God will go back to dealing with man according to their sin. And all who did not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be subject to the judgment of God because of their rejection of Jesus. Now, but during this time period right now, we live in a very, very special time. God is not dealing with us according to our sin, and I'm so thankful because there's so much freedom and liberty. Matter of fact, if you'll understand it right, you'll understand that, uh, that truthfully, Sin has been defeated during our time period. Now watch this. He goes on to say, but he turned and he rebuked them. Jesus rebuked them for wanting to call down fire, which was done under the old covenant, and it was no problem. See, but the heart of God is not to call down fire. And I, and I know Christians are like, well, we just call down fire. No, 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 listen, that's not God's will. God, matter of fact, Jesus goes on to say what he wants. He says, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of basically saying it wasn't God's spirit. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives. Boy, that's the truth. You know, the Bible says very clearly that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. You know, the title of our program is called Experience the Life. Jesus has a life for you. He wants you to live out that life. I'm trying to, my very best to live out the life that God has for me. And I'm working it out every day with fear before the Lord. And I say fear, not in the sense of a fear of anger of God, but a fear and a reverence of God, that God is awesome and I love him so much. And here's the truth. He Jesus didn't come to destroy men, but to save men. That's what he came to do. And they went to another village. That's all it says, that they went on. See, it was never God's plan to destroy. It was God's plan to save. So listen to this. During this period of time right now, here's what you'll find out. God, right now, resurrection, is serving God under the new covenant and the new creation. That's what God's into. I think about it as Hebrews chapter 10. I would go back and read Hebrews chapter 10, chapters, chapter 11, because it will bless you because it's talking about the new covenant, because most people don't recognize the power of the new covenant in, the, in their life. Look at this. Previously, previously saying, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings of sin you did not desire. That's talking about the law. God did not like their suffering, okay? He says, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. God was not, he did not have pleasure in all their offerings. So you say, how does that translate to my world? People say, well, I just need to suffer for God. I just need to suffer. I need to suffer. I need to suffer. That's like the Old Testament law. That doesn't please God. I'll tell you what pleases God, putting your faith and trust in what Jesus did. When you put your faith and trust in what Jesus did, that is what pleases God. It goes on to say, which are offered according to the law. 
He goes, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Talking about Jesus. He takes away the first, the law, that he may establish the second. Grace and faith, the New Testament. I love it. Watch this. By that will, we have been sanctified already. I am sanctified. I'm not trying to get sanctified. I don't have to dress a certain way to be sanctified. Jesus has made me sanctified, and I believe what he did. Look at this. Through the offering of his body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, if you hop down just a few more verses, chapter 10, verse 16 is absolutely awesome. Because I don't know why. But as I was going to church, I was told more about my sin and the problem of my sin than I ever was to put my faith in Christ. I was beat down over my sin, your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin. But look at this. Here's what the Bible says. This is the covenant I will make with them after these days. This is right now, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds. I will write them. Look at this. He says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. <laughs> Praise God. Their sins and their lawless deeds. This is new covenant. Third time period. God is not dealing with me according to my sin. Now, stick around. A couple weeks I'm going to be talking about, can you live in sin and still be a believer? I'm not going there right now. But what I'm trying to say is that most Christians are walking around thinking God is focused on their sin. And because of that, listen to this, you are more sin conscious than you are God conscious. And because of that, you wonder why you can't get free from your sin. Well, it's because you're always meditating on sin. You're always like, well, I hope I don't sin. I hope I don't sin. I hope I don't sin. I hope I didn't sin. I hope I do, don't sin. I hope this doesn't sin. I hope that doesn't sin. Your sin is the focus. In the New Testament, your focus should be Jesus. As you fall in love with Jesus, your sins will fall by the wayside. See, most churches are sin conscious driven, make people feel bad about their experience with God. If they feel bad enough, then they'll repent hard enough so that they'll go and live right. So they beat them down every week, telling them what they're not doing right and tell them about all their sin. I'll be honest with you. I don't preach about sin too much. I'll tell people God has a standard, but I don't preach against sin like, like people oftentimes think, turn or burn. Listen, that's not the love of God being demonstrated abroad in our heart. Listen, I believe in this, and I believe this is what the Bible is teaching, that we should preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, praise God. And by people seeing Jesus and falling in love with Jesus, they'll fall out of love with their sin. So I believe that being God conscious is more powerful than sin conscience. And when you get that right, man, I tell you what, you'll get free from your sin. So listen, if you're sitting there and you're an alcoholic struggling with alcohol, quit focusing on the bottle. Quit focusing on alcoholism. Quit focusing on your addiction. Start focusing on Jesus. No matter where you're at, what you're doing, what you've been through, where you're going, all right? Focus on Jesus. If you focus on what he did, he will begin to break it off of you and get you free. Praise God, I'm preaching. I love it. Look at this. This is the good news. This is the gospel that you are no longer, no longer is God dealing with you according to your sins. Your sins and your lawless deeds, he will remember no more. How many times have you ever heard that in church? Your sins and your lawless deeds, he will remember no more. But that's exactly what the Bible teaches the new covenant is. Look at this, it goes on. It says, now where there is a remission of these sins, there is no longer an offering of sin. Jesus came once and for all. There's no longer a need for him to offer any longer. He took care of your sins once forever, past, present, and future. Look at this. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. That's right. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than my sin. Look at this. My, by a new and living way. Notice the old way was a death way. The new way is a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Look at this. It gets better. And having a high priest over the house of God. Now, remember, a priest represents us before God. OK, now watch this. What does he represent us doing? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. See, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. I'm no longer worried about evil. I'm no longer worried about sin. See, Adam and Eve, when they fell, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God wants you to focus on the good, not the evil. So Jesus came and died and not 
dealing with you according to your sin, but dealing with you according to faith in Jesus so that your conscience could be good and our bodies washed pure as water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is 100% absolutely faithful. I believe it with all my heart. So in light of that, let me give you one more verse and now I'm gonna give you three powerful things you should know. Or do not despise the riches of his goodness. Aren't you glad that God is not dealing with you according to your sin? Aren't you glad that God is not sitting there going, you're a sinner? Now, I know the church you may go to may do that, but let me tell you, God is not doing that. He has freed you from sin. When you put your faith in Christ, you are free from sin. Sin has been paid for. It is defeated over your life, and I stand in a place of victory over sin, praise God. My focus is Jesus, and my focus is God, and therefore sin has no power over me. My sins and my lawless deeds, he remembers no more. Therefore, I refuse to remember I'm not going to live in them no longer. And it goes on to say, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. I tell you, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. No doubt about it. When you realize that God is so good, he is not dealing with you according to your sin. Now, did he do that under the old covenant law? Yes, but I don't believe that's what he wanted. I believe for the first 2,500 years of mankind's history, he wanted to deal with them based on faith and grace. Then for the 1,500 years of the law, he dealt with them according to their sin and law. But do not bring that now into your understanding now. Hebrews chapter 10, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Jesus came and died on the cross. You are free from sin. Don't worry about it. Break it off of you. Focus on Jesus. Fall out of love with your sin, fall in love with Jesus. If you'll do that, you're going to live free. For whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Now listen, my time's coming to an end. I got more, I promise. But listen, here's what we're going to do right now. If you'd like to know more about this series, I'm going to give you a way to do that. But if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, maybe you've been burnt by religion, maybe you've been burnt by church. I'm here to tell you, ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. He's not dealing with you according to your sin. He's dealing with you according to his sacrifice on the cross. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I believe you came and died on the cross. I believe you're my savior. If you'll do that with all of your heart, I believe with all my heart, you'll be on your way to heaven. But listen, that's not the finish line. That's a starting line with a relationship with God. Next thing you need to do, get into a Bible-believing church. There are literally hundreds of great churches and pastors. Find a place to go where you can be fed the word of God and where the gospel, the good news is being preached, all right? Now, if you're looking for a place, we'd love to invite you out to Abundant Life Church. We have two great locations, one right in Westfield on Grassy Branch Road. We meet at Washington Woods Elementary School every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. We'd love for you to bring your entire family. Also in Kokomo, we have five great services, Saturday, 5 and 6.30, and on Sunday, 8.30, 10 and 11.30. If you want this series absolutely free, I go into greater detail of it. I can't cover everything that we got here right now, but listen to this. If you'd like to to get this series, give us a call. Give our offices a call. Give us an email. Uh, You can email us on the information below or give us a call at 765-457-5880. We would love to hear from you. We love you from Pastor Charlie and Abundant Life Church. That's all the time I got. We'll see you next week. Same bat station, same bat channel. You don't want to miss it.